Yeah, no, they they definitely weren't. Yeah. Um, Which was strange to me because they they were kind of barking up the same tree. It's just one of them on one side couldn't see the other one on the other side. And the rabbinical piece versus the psychological piece. I mean, it, there's so many things that now I go, oh, I could see the civil war happening between the two of them. Yeah. So for for reasons passing understanding, good morning, everyone. Uh, for reasons passing understanding, which Jordan and I are having trouble understanding, um, Martin Buber and Carl Jung had a controversy going between them. And, uh, and so we're going to talk about that today. And uh, Dr. Jung uh, wrote lots of letters. This is uh, volume two uh, of the collected letters of C.G. Jung. There, believe it or not, I was told by James Hollis that there are still 100,000 um, <coughs> young letters that are not published. Now, that sounds like a lot uh, in today's context, but let's just understand what this was. Um, in his time, there, was, there were no emails or text messages. And uh, so everything had, had to go out over his secretary and, and uh, she had to make carbon copies and so on. And so oftentimes he wrote very short letters, um, but this particular letter uh, that we're gonna talk about today um, was, uh, was a letter that was, is four and a half, or no, I'm sorry, two and a half pages long, three pages long, I'd say, in the book. And uh, before we get to that letter, I wanted to share this, uh, quote, just for fun, this doesn't have anything to do, do with Buber and Jung, uh, except peripherally, but this is a quote that uh, Young Society of Washington is using today, so I decided to, to grab it and share it with you. So uh, can you see that now, Jordan? Yes. Okay. Um, so do you want to go ahead and read it and comment on it? Surely. Continual conscious realization of unconscious fantasies, together with active participation in the fantastic events, has, as I have witnessed in a very large number of cases, the effect of firstly, the, the effect firstly of extending the conscious horizon by the inclusion of numerous unconscious contents. Secondly, of gradually diminishing the dominant influence of the unconscious, and thirdly, of bringing about a change of personality. Quote Carl Jung from Collected Works, Volume 7, Paragraph 358. Commenting on that, what's, what I love about that is it, it walks through the sequence of the events within the process of individuation coming then to the fruition of not behavioral change, of actual sea change personality change. That is the evolution of someone's personality, which I would actually say might not be so much change as it is just continual growth, which is change. So I won't split that hair. Yeah. Thoughts, Skip, from you on this quote. Um, okay. I. Um... This, this was sent out on an email from Young Society of Washington uh, with the headline, A Container for the Psyche, which is what their topic is for today. And I'm not going to get into containers for the psyche, but um, basically, you know, you have to have a, a system that, of what, how you're going to look at the world. Um, in terms of containers. And if you don't have a container, then ultimately your unconscious can overwhelm you. And, um, and it, it's interesting, Dr. Jung's essay on marriage uh, is incredibly interesting because he says that in a marriage, 
one side, one person has to be the container of the marriage and the other is inside the marriage. And so I guess what that would say is something like, um, you know, one has to be the person that it assures safety and comfort within the marriage so that the other can live. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, when I, when I, uh, the first time I was married, um, my ex wife said that, you know, you're a really big person, Skip. Uh, and the point was that she was, she was in the container that I was providing, uh, in terms of, you know, security and all these things. Uh, but, the container was too big for her. And so she was rattling around inside there and, uh, and she couldn't think of her life in terms of, um, you know, a global context. She wanted to live her life in, in a, a very small, I can see it from where, I, from my front porch type of thing. And uh, in, Indeed, she accuses me of dropping her off in my hometown, um, but <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, um, uh, you know, we divorced. I don't know um, more than thirty years ago, and she's still living in my hometown. <laughs> uh, and uh, she, you know, she found a container that was her right size. But in, in turn, uh, and so I, I do want to talk about containers, and maybe we'll talk about that essay at some point. But uh, in terms of this continually, continual conscious realization, um, you know, we all have fa fantasies, we all have experiences with, you know, big dreams and visions. Sometimes some of us have visions I certainly do and um, you know if you have those and can hang on um, you know and not get inundated by them then um, then you're going to have a much fuller life if you don't um, have them under control um, you might have some mental health difficulties, I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to comment on the, the container piece yeah. too, because I think if I kind of did a swivel head forensic recon of my memory of anything I've read from Carl Jung, um, one of the most repeated, almost like, man, the horse is dead, stop kicking it. That level of repeated phrases is going to be, the vessel is the container and the contained at one and the same time. So the both and of the, so for example, the marriage is both the container and the contained. But when he, he says the container and the contained at one and the same time, I'm 500,000 times in the collected works easy. I mean, maybe not that many, but it's, it's, it's pretty repetitive. I mean, it's almost like a metronome. It's almost like a Carl Jung, psychological musical metronome it's so frequent yeah uh it, miles makes an interesting comment here she, he says i am the container but my wife decorates it and calls all the shots <laughs> <laughs> so it's the, it's the saturday pottery painting <laughs> yeah. <laughs> go, yeah, go, uh, yeah yeah nice and uh hello, hello good morning kushbu or good evening kushbu uh I morning. did see your WhatsApp this morning, but I haven't been able to respond to it yet. So, uh, Miles, I do want to comment on that. I actually have a coffee cup. I should have brought it today. Um, and on it, it has, uh, you, you probably know this, it has cactus in it. It says, if, if a man speaks in the desert and no <laughs> woman hears him, is he still wrong? And and uh, what I have to say is emphatically yes, <laughs> because because uh, we're only half a loaf, honestly. And if we have a have a spouse, 
or a partner. <laughs> um, the spouse fills in the other side of the yin yang, if you will. And, and so, you know, you're still, you're still going to be wrong no matter what you do. So um, you, you have to learn to ride that horse. <laughs> you, you know, and I won't, I won't get it off into the details and such there, but at the same time, a friend of mine has a, a friend of mine has a coffee cup and it says, if your wife says, do what you want, don't, don't even think about it. Don't move, freeze. In fact, play dead um, well like, um probably why i'm not married uh yeah, may, maybe uh but anyway there's um uh there was a writer in in the olympics a german writer i believe uh in the olympics and he was um in the you know, the jumping competition. And every th time he went over the jump, a jump, he would throw his arms out to one side and lean way out to, uh, I think, the right side as he jumped over the, over the fences. And uh, everybody thought this was really weird because it wasn't pretty. And, and most people think of, you know, jump, jumping as a, as a beautiful sport and they enjoy watching it for that reason. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so this wasn't pretty. <laughs> and uh, so afterward, the a commentator was asking him uh, why he did that. And he said, well, um, my, my horse jumps crooked and if I don't do that, I won't balance him. So I do that every jump so that we're in balance going over the jump. And of course he won the gold medal. And so yeah. you have to... <laughs> find your own way. Yeah. You certainly yeah. have to find your own way. Yeah. So that's a great, to... that's a really great story though, because if, for example, he didn't do that, the right. horse wouldn't jump well and he would probably get thrown off. So there's right. not even any progress. So it's, it's interesting about that, that dance there. It's kind of a Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers equivalent. Yeah, right. You know, she's doing everything he's doing except backwards and then heels. You right. know, it's like. So uh, in my marriage, Debbie and I take turns being the, the container, yeah. I would say. Uh, because, um, you know, especially... I, I can turn about, talk about the simple things uh, because I've had quite a number of surgeries that have required long uh, recovery. Uh, you know, I had to rely on Debbie uh, to be the container, um, you know, during those times. And, you know, also we, we share the load on, on the financial front. And so, um, you know, I rely on her sometimes. She relies on me sometimes, and and uh, that allows us to have, you know, a really big life in terms of experience. It doesn't mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that we have a big house or anything. We don't, um, and we we never have any money in our part pocket per se, but. Oh, by the way, we also have uh, traveled around the world. Both of us have done it um, many times, and you know we've we've met in a in a airport satellite uh, gate at at a Narita Airport in Japan, and and uh, we've one time uh, she was doing a program in Alexandria, Egypt, and. Um, I was in Dubai and um, I had a couple of days off. So I decided I'd go fly over to Alexandria uh, to spend a couple of days with her and see what she was up to. So I flew over to Alexandria. She didn't know I was coming. And the guy at the desk says, well, your husband's here. And she says, no, he's not. He's in Dubai. And he says, well, no, <laughs> he's upstairs. <laughs> I thought I thought you were going to say that you got to the hotel and they said, oh, she just went she just went to Dubai to see you. 
<laughs> well, there could have been that too. You know, but, that synchronicity of, oh, sometimes surprises go completely wrong. <laughs> yeah. Because most people that, are doing the same thing. Speaking of Alexandria, if if ever you get an opportunity to visit Alexandria, Egypt, and to go mm-hmm. to the new uh, Library of Alexandria, it is just a monumental place. It, ha- it has three or four museums attached to it, and the architecture of it is stupendous. And uh, it's the most amazing, certainly the most amazing library, if not the most amazing um building i've ever been in and so i urge you to take you know and that that that's that's number two on my list it's right in behind it's a subset of current luxor at karnak because the temple of luxor at karnak has been for 30 years kind of my go-to thing you know with the temple and man etc and even this year they did this the lights light display in such a way that it's going to become an annual thing so um that's very much not anywhere near the bottom. It's right on number one, number two on my travel list. Yep. And um, a good buddy says, and, and the container would have personality. Yes, they do. And uh, Kathy Kerr says, uh, I love that skip marriage is being willing to be witnessed and companioned someday, blah, blah, blah. And then, uh, ellipsis anyway okay i promised this battle about uh about actually uh, real quick one more well if i have ahead. one right here um here we go. hold on let me grab one Just, I think, one last thing on the container, too. Um, my headphones sound weird. Can you hear me? Yep, can hear you. Okay. Yep. So it's interesting to me. It's um, If you take like that. The uh, uh, Just a minute. I'm, I don't have you on my screen. Uh, go ahead. Show me now. Yeah, to take the Kintsugoroi uh-huh. of self of the Japanese broken vessel Mm -hmm. where a vessel is better for having been broken and it's repaired with gold, silver, or platinum lacquer. Mm -hmm. And I kind of transliterated the idea to be the, that's just Kintsugoroi, the Japanese art of fixing broken pottery. But to me, Kintsugoroi of self, where we are better for having been broken, that with that vessel and that container, if instead of getting triggered, and creating motion limiting scars that have to either have apology or repair or just be speed bumps moving you know, forward. If we can engage without trigger and actually deeply listen by being unthreatened, then in that moment, we create a golden connection between each other with multiple perspectives in the broken pieces. So that then to me, the vessel, the container, And that Japanese art is a great metaphor for a living container that's not Tupperware. You know, it's not going to bounce on the floor. It's it's going to break, and it's going to break a lot. But those breaks are golden experiences of connection between the two pieces. Yeah. Well, I I I have to grab a ten thousand volt uh, yeah power line today because. uh, earlier this year, I gave each of my other daughters uh, on their birthdays a Tim Holmes uh, sculpture. <laughs> and, number three. <laughs> and, and my eldest daughter's birthday is, uh, and I got, uh, I got criticized roundly um, after the second one, because I did not include my wife in the selecting of the, of the piece and or discussing the expense that was involved. And, um, and so I was criticized roundly and, and therefore I finally decided in early December that I was going to get the third one uh, 
piece and I got it for her. She's going to get it on Tuesday, which is her birthday. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I, sometime today or tomorrow, I have to tell Deb this is going down. <laughs> I know it's going to be. <laughs> uh, but well, anyway. as an electrician told me, when he goes home every night, he goes, I'm glad I'm an electrician. He goes, electricians who do this die because they get shocked and they, they clamp. He goes, just grab it like this. And when you clamp, it pulls off and you won't get stuck. Right. <laughs> okay, so, so maybe so, approach it with the, you know, that instead of the. <laughs> okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm, right, I've, so. I've actually done a PDF of. Um, oh, nice. Of this le letter. And um, uh, let's see, here we go. Uh, I'm going to let people read along with it. Uh, and what I'm showing you is a PDF of uh, volume two of the collected letters of C.G. Young. And I bought this book at great expense. Um, I, I think I paid $65 for it used, um, mm -hmm. but I knew that I would, I would uh, treat it lovingly for years. And... Um, so let's see and some out of print books are just that's it it's the value and, and yeah. you're gonna you're gonna use it more than i'm glad we're talking about young versus boober today now i'll stop there now no spoilers but okay um, so what do you know about about the controversy well what's that? interesting to me is the controversy has been outside my radar mostly because i no. discovered martin boober while I was reading the collected works and I, I found the, the book, I Thou. Yeah. And to me, it felt like a wonderful relationship builder with self, a wonderful relationship builder with another person. And um, the thou was the higher self. The thou mm -hmm. was the sacred inner divinity and um, coupled with the I. And so in that sense, the I was the container and the vessel was the contained was the heart of the matter that was the thou. So then I didn't, I didn't delve any further into any, any kind of historical interrelationship between Jung and Buber. So mm -hmm. I was completely taken blindside, civil war surprised that they were at odds because it felt like they were just using different words for the same thing, as if literally they were barking up the exact same big tree except maybe one on one side couldn't see the other one on the other side. And then well, that, maybe that's poor exactly, and professional jealousy. And that, that's exactly right. Except for one very thin hair that, that young, um, that young sliced. And as a result of that, I mean, he, he was quite, um, argumentative with Uber, I think. Um, mm -hmm. and, and to me, he's hair splitting here. But um, anyway, let's, uh, let's go into it. Yeah. I, I'm going to share my screen here. And so first of all, this is um, a letter to uh, Robert C. Smith. And Robert and the footnote reads, uh, then in, in Villanova, Pennsylvania, uh, not, now an assistant professor of philosophy and religion at Trenton State University, New Jersey. At the time of writing, uh, Smith was preparing as a thesis, quote, a critical analysis of religious and philosophical issues between Buber and Jung. Um, and uh, he refers us back to a letter to Neumann. Norman, Eric. Yeah. yeah. All right. And so in this letter, in his letter, uh, Smith had reported a conversation with Buber in which the latter had accused Jung of being a mon monologist, uh, having rent reduced God to an object and maintaining that Jung's statement that without man, no God would be possible was an ontological denial of God. Okay, so so he's accusing uh, Jung of 
denying God, which never he did, okay, and which his ancestors would have gotten after him pretty severely, I suspect, if he had done that. Um, well, and he was somewhat being empirical, but also making it a livable God, a living God. And God yes. is right here in front of us, a capital N nature God, right. not Shintoism. But where it's the life-affirming spirituality of living the life rather than a dry academic text. Um, right. he, he really was trying to get at that. And I find the other piece, I think, of the Boober Young Civil War, which was the same with other um, religions, is just rather than go rabbinical, I'll just jump up to a higher scale and say it's ecclesiastical versus psychological. And his psychological is more robust, and it's not limited by catechism. Right. Okay. So let me uh, uh, let me read this. I'm going to read it word for word, and we'll sort of stop every paragraph or so and okay. comment comment on it. So it's 1960. I actually thought of trying to find this Mr. Smith, Robert C. Smith, but it, I, you know, it was a thought that crossed my mind and. This letter was written 61 years ago, so right. chances of finding Mr. Smith in any sort of uh, condition to actually converse with me. <laughs> well, unless we go to the Matrix, we'll find plenty of Smiths. <laughs> right. But, but anyway, okay, so Boober and I start from an entirely different basis. I make no transcendental statements. Uh, I am essentially empirical. As I have stated more than once, I am dealing with psychic phenomena and not with metaphysical assertions. Within the frame of psychic events, I find the fact of the belief in God. It says, God is. This is the fact that I am concerned with. I am not concerned with the truth or the untruth of God's existence. I am concerned with the statement only and I'm interested in its structure and behavior. It is an emotionally toned complex like the father or mother complex or the Oedipus complex. It is obvious that if man does not exist, no such statement can exist, nor can anybody prove that the statement God exists um, in a non-human sphere. Okay, so Jordan to you. You know, that's, that's, that's classic young empirical, if then PQ, if then PQ, if then, if and only if peak. I mean, so he plays the logic game, but at the same time, he does it in a robust way. That's, it's not just literal that kills it like capital R too much Greek reason. Um, it's the, if you remove the human from the equation, there is no equation is what he's saying. If, yeah. if this question is not going to arise, so he's not playing the Aristotle or Aristotelian platonic unmoved mover, playing the idea abstractly. He's playing the idea, I, I find it interestingly, with not, not concerned with truth or untruth, he's playing it truthfully for what is right here with the considerations that are in the mix. And this, this one passage reminds me of what I call FICP in my process. And that's functionally interrelated component parts. It's all hyphenated. It's all one big giant word. If you move one, the other three move two. So here, if you remove the human, you move the person, then the statement yeah. is inherently removed. And then at that point, the question becomes moot. It feels as the that's what I think he's saying here, that he's not dealing with the transcendental statement of if the human was gone, can we still discuss if God exists? He's not playing the God is dead piece. He says it right there where it's um, God is. So I, yeah. I find that and, there's, it's and, a very loaded paragraph and it's very dense, but I find it's also very accessible. If you just go phrase by phrase, he's saying a lot in this paragraph. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, well, first of all, he, he says he's not talking about the metaphysical God. Right. And people asked 
him, others asked him, I don't recall this being a, a boober thing, but others asked him, why do you call that God? And he says, why not? It's been called that for <laughs> thousands of years. <laughs> it's a perfectly good name <laughs> yes. for what I'm talking about. And, well, and um, right there, that's exactly like Mark Twain. You know, do, are you afraid of death? No, I was dead billions of years before I was born, and it affected me not at the least. <laughs> <laughs> right. Same kind of thing. It's been done forever. So Right. Okay, so uh, Jung is... Um, accused of being a Gnostic. And, um, you know, he, I think he probably would wear that proudly. And in fact, in mm -hmm. fact, he did wear a, a Gnostic ring very often. And, um, but, but his point is that it, it's Gnostic and plus, 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 uh, you know, it's, he's not only a Gnostic. Uh, he would probably like the Gnostics, Jung would. But, mm -hmm. um, but so anyway, we'll read on here. What, what Buber misunderstands as Gnosticism is psychiatric observation of which he obviously knows nothing. <laughs> okay, so he, here's where Jung gets a little bit. Uh, hyperbolic here, uh, saying that Buber does, knows nothing about psychiatry. It is certainly not my uh, invention. Buber has been led astray by a poem in Gnostic style I made 44 years ago for a friend's birthday celebration, a private print, a poetic paraphrase of the psychology of the unconscious. And this is uh, Setum Sermonis. Uh, which appears in the Red Book and um, the Seven Sermons, right? Yeah, the Seven Sermons to the Dead, uh, and um, it was it was written anonymously, and he had used the name of a of a famous Gnostic as the author, um, and um, and so you know. He, he said later on that it was a youthful mistake to do that because people kept pointing back to that. And uh, that's interesting too, because it's almost just like going to a poetry class and okay, write in the style of, and then insert whatever name of whatever poet. And, but then that one piece he does is so powerfully that, that it sticks out. I mean, tallest blade of grass first to get cut. And this one certainly is pretty tall. Yeah. So anyway, um, every pioneer is a monologist until other people have tried out his method and confirmed his results. Would you call all the great minds which were not popular among their contemporaries monologists, even that, quote, voice of one crying in the wilderness, unquote. Um, so he's saying, you know, I'm I'm a, a pioneer here, and so I, you know, I may make some mistakes as I go along, and surely he made a few. Um, you know, I have to comment on the hyperbolic and his humor is because the voice of the one crying in the wilderness would be talking about God without the human present to make the statement. I mean, there's the, you can't know. I mean... Yeah. Okay, so Uber having no practical experience in depth psychology does not know the autonomy of complexes, uh, a most easily observable fact, however. Thus God as an autonomous complex is a subject confronting me. One must be really blind if one cannot get that from my books. Likewise, the self is a redoubtable reality as everybody learns who has tried or was compelled to do something about it. Yet I define the self as a borderline concept. This must be a puzzler for people like Buber who are unacquainted with the empiric empiricist's epistemology. Okay, so you wanna address that? Well, especially the last two words, the empiricist epistemology. I mean, epistemology is the philosophy of um, how we know something. So in a sense, an etymology or how did the word evolve, word evolve in etymology? But with science, there's empiricism, facts, studies, you know, conclusions, hypotheses. 
And so the epistemology of the empiricist is basically look at how ingrained these scientific habits are. What are your beliefs? What are your expectations? And if he's even unacquainted with that, then Jung is going against something that Buber doesn't even have much of a concern with. Now, I don't know if the word awareness is correct. Uh, Buber was pretty robust, but it probably was not one of his primary uh, foci, you know, one of primary focuses um, kind of thing. So, but when he says one must be really blind, if one that cannot get that from my books, he's already starting to warm up the warm up the guns, you know. Well, and yeah, and he, um, you know, separately he admitted that theo theologians were in the same business as right. psychologists. So um, to suggest that Buber uh, doesn't know the autonomy of complexes, uh, he may call them something different, as you say, but I think it's fair enough to say that Buber does know them by a different name, perhaps. I think yeah. so, because any rabbi, any pastor, in a sense, becomes a natural psychologist, whether they've been trained in counseling or not. Honestly, right. um, honestly, bartenders, um, sommelier, um, the wine experts, mm -hmm. um, and croupier, people who are professional card dealers. Um, a friend of mine in Britain, a, a friend of mine in Britain was a croupier, a professional card dealer for 12 years. She said, I, I didn't know anything about psychology until two years in and realized, oh my, I am dealing with every type of person every day. And so, you know, her not making conclusions and having realizations, there were the croupier, the psychologist, and then the, the rabbi or pastor, they had the same kind of psychological acumen. And I think you're right. Your quote that you put up often too, that in, in more older times, pre 19th century or pre 18th, 20th century, the 1900s, 1800s, early on, that the church was the primary psychotherapeutic event. They came off nature, off the land into the church and there was their capital S silence. And that was a place of perspective and of eternal ember hope kind of thing. So that they're in the same business, I would, I would redoubtably agree. <laughs> yeah. To use and, his word. Um, the one, one thing I just added a underline to my copy of this book, but you folks don't see it, which is um, quote, uh, yet I define the self as a borderline concept. Mm -hmm. Um do you want to comment on what he means by that? I, I would like you to, because that, when you were reading it, that struck me as quite interesting. Um, yeah, because most people think when we're talking about Jungian psychology, that we're, we're talking about something central, not borderline. But, but the point I think that he's making here is that and he always emphasized it in his interviews, which was the unconscious is really unconscious. Okay, mm -hmm. it's not. It's not. It's not something that you can just, uh, you know, tra la tra la tra la. Today I'm going to go out and and you know work my way through all of the unconscious. There, there's just so much out there that no human, no one human being could possibly get it all and so in that sense it's like you know going up to the ocean and um you know that the ocean <laughs> is is the self but you can only deal with the with the surf on the beach really and mm -hmm. um, right and and that's what what i think he's talking about here and um and obviously the ocean is quite autonomous and, and um, you know, God works in mysterious ways. And Well, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I think with that too, going back to the container, I think he's literally kind of being a little coy, but as the borderline concept, the perimeter of the bowl, the perimeter of the container, the, the point between the coastline, the point of the coastline between the ocean and the land, 
that the self is the container in a sense, whereas, you know, the unconscious is really unconscious. It's the ocean, but it's not the contents in the ocean. It's just the ocean. And so I think that borderline piece doesn't mean it's almost a concept that the borderline concept is almost like a property line in architecture uh, or in proper real estate. You can't see the property line. You won't walk down the street and notice a property line unless you know how to read survey pens and fence posts. And But there's that borderline concept of this property line. So the self, in a sense, is, individ- is invisible. And so that, to me, strikes a chord. I mean, I have thoughts from your perspective on that? Um, kind of a property line. It's the coastline. It's the yeah, it's the I, it's right, the it, limits of the bowl or the container. Yeah, the powerful I mean, it, limits. It's a it's a you know it's a it's a circle with um, with no center, right? And or, yes, yes. I forget how it was put before, but uh, it's a it's a circle whose circumference is everywhere and whose center is nowhere or something like Mm -hmm. that Um, right and And if the center appears it's not necessarily in the middle yeah and uh so anyway we don't have to get into that in great detail but um why cannot boober get it into his head that i and here again he's being um you know, he's, he thinks he's writing a letter that nobody else is ever going to read except Robert right. C. Smith, of course. And so he's he's being he's misbehaving a little bit, it seems to me. But uh, this is how he's. It's also kind of this. It's kind of I have to say it's kind of cute. There's this young, the mature, young, the insightful, and then also you you hear his four-year-old tantrum frustration, but in very intellectual tone. Right. So why can I Boober get it into his head that I deal with psychic facts and not with metaphysical assertions? Boober is a theologian and has far more information about God's true existence <laughs> and, <laughs> and other of his qualities than I could ever dream of acquiring. <laughs> My ambitions are not soaring to theological heights. I am merely concerned with the practical and theoretical problem of how do complexes behave for instance, how does a mother complex behave in a child and in an adult? How does the God complex behave in different individuals and societies? How does the self complex compare with the Lapis Philosophorum in Hermetic philosophy with, and with the Christ figure in patristic allegories uh, with Al- Ch- Al-Qadir in Islamic tradition with Tifereth in the Kabbalah with Mithras, Atis, Odin, Krishna, and so on. Um, and uh, so he basically, yeah, he basically makes a statement there that he is simply adding, you know, add one comma at the end of it and put self, you know, Krishna, Odin, Atis, Mithras from Mith- Mithraic legend, Kabbalah, Tifereth. Al-Qadir, and then comma, self. He's just adding one word, and he's saying that this is a cross-cultural connection that's consistent regardless of age of culture, regardless of historical lineage. Um, and he's, he's basically saying, I'm, like he says, I am merely concerned with how do complexes behave. So Odin, Mithras, Otis, Krishna, al I mean, so it's all of these. How do they behave? And then if you look at how they behave, you're looking at just different names for the same phenomenon that occurs within the human psyche. Yeah. Um, and, um, and someone here said that, it, um, that life doesn't present happiness but or you know life is hell but you know as jesus said you know heaven is spread upon the earth but men do not see it Mm -hmm. um and 
Well, then that's, you know, perspective. Your reality is what you make of it. If, if you're yeah. looking for trouble, you're going to find trouble. If you're looking for gold, you probably will find it. I yeah. mean, it's my one of my primary mantras is don't waste trouble. When the storm yeah. arrives, the gold is always in the chaos because the chaos yeah. is the nature. Stuff stirred up and, and you find it. You don't have to dig so hard. Yeah. If you put your nose in, lean in, be the eye in your own storm, you're not going to be always comfortable in fact it probably often never will be except until you get used to it and then you expect it and it becomes a better norm and beautiful things come from it instead of always shying away that you know life's hell or you know life's a bitch or you know shit is going to happen it's like well you know you also can be conspired to be showered with blessings it's just which cup are you going to sit in yeah and thomas says i think Jung knew also that Buber is not interested in comparative religion. Well, that's probably mm. true. You know, I guess there's few uh, rabbis per se that that are interested in comparing Judaism. That's with Christianity. really good point. That's a really good point because it takes it. Honestly, it would take a Buber. It takes a Jung. I mean, Buber is capable, but it wasn't in, of interest at that point. Um, but to actually have transcended your own profession, for lack of a better word, but how does a pastor transcend being a pastor? How does a rabbi transcend being a rabbi? How does a psychologist transcend being a psychologist? The ability is to find the cross professional connections where, oh, we're, we're, wow, look at the oral tradition. We're telling the same story with different language, but it is conceptually archetypally the same thing. Right. Okay. So uh, as you see, I am concerned with images, human phenomena, of which only the ignorant can assume they are within our control or that they can be reduced to mere objects. Every psychiatrist and psychotherapist can tell you to what an enormous degree man is delivered over to the terrific power of a complex, which is assumed superiority over his mind, vita compulsion, neurosis, schizophrenia, drugs, political and private nonsense, etc. Mental possessions are just as good as ghosts, demons, and gods. I'm going to leave that to you, Jordan. I'm going to step away. Okay. So as you see, I'm concerned with images, human phenomena of which only ignorant can assume that they are within our control or that they can be reduced to mere objects. So what's interesting here is the concept of control, the concept of empiricism, frankly, the concept of the parent, having to show your work, explain yourself, the answering the question why. Whereas when the child becomes the parent of the adult, you are your own parent, you answer to yourself, then that goes away to become your values. And oftentimes you don't reduce these things to objects. You do things because they feel right. So I think the images, human phenomena, um, of which only the ignorant, he says, can assume they are within our control. I think they're within our consciousness and our unconscious, but they're not within our control. So in a sense, I would use the analogy of swimming in water, swimming, be it a pool in the ocean, the ocean would be a little more um, interesting for the analogy. Are there sharks? Are there puffer fish? Are there jellyfish? Is there cool kelp dancing around? Is there beautiful coral, colorful fish that aren't poisonous? I mean, these, these things are within the ocean, but we don't control them. They are objects, but we don't reduce them to objects. So I think here it begins with the, the living object of how things influence one another. And then when he goes next into every psychiatrist, psychiatrist and psychotherapist, et cetera, there is a terrific power in the complex because then what happens with that example I gave of the ocean, beautiful coral, poisonous fish, beautiful fish that aren't poisonous, sharks, puffer fish, et cetera, you don't control those. They are objects, but they are living. So they're not reduced to objects. But that terrific power of a complex is that it's living, swimming in that whole larger ocean. 
So it seems to me he's making a clarification um, when he says, which has assumed superiority over his mind. Um, that's important where the ocean doesn't take over, but the ocean does provide a larger container for multiple vessels to swim in. So in your right. back now too. Right. Um, so let's see. One man and his detector says we're all born into a, a pair system. Uh, Au pair, as in someone no, taking a, care of someone? A, no, no, a, a pair. Oh, system. pair. Okay. And and yes, and the point of Jungian psychology is that you you have to hold both sides of the pair in consciousness, and that's how you individuate. And uh, so it's like you know, why does Skip wear purple shirts? I, I wear purple shirts to keep myself conscious that my fellow Americans uh, include both red state and blue state people, but they're all American, for example. Yeah, um, and then I, I play the, the divinity, male, masculine divinity, feminine, that's not really gendered, that's part of the self, as a capital B, capital A, both squiggly hyphen and... It's a both yeah. and phenomenon, and I don't play the either or game anymore. Yeah. It's not about this or that. It's about context and how to make decisions on the fly in a living context, but not because, oh, this is so safe. My, I mean, my joke is, no, no, I jumped, well, but you didn't have a parachute. Yeah, I heard there's a better deal on the way down. You know, so yeah. <laughs> you can well, play I'm that in the living. Right. And one of the key points here, because we're talking about um, all these different traditions in different parts of the world, uh, Qatar and Islam and Tifereth and Kabbalah and so on, uh, is that, you know, when, when Edward Edinger was uh, interviewed by Lawrence Yaffe, uh, he he was asked, you know, what does Jung's work have to do with religion? And uh, Edinger said, everything, everything. And the point is that, that um, Jung cracked through to the source of all religions. That's the point. And so, you know, we, all of us need some container perhaps to control our, our um, spiritual life. And, you know, it, it worked, Christianity works fine. So does Judaism. So does um, every other religion found on the planet for some people. And it, it's actually dependent upon where you happen to have been born in the world, but, you know, religions are a container for your um, psychological and spiritual life. But at some point, and we have this nihilist problem now in the 20th century and beyond where people have just turned their back, you know, who, people have lost their faith and, and tend to be derisive of of religions and the point is um, religions aren't bad they're not wrong maybe they didn't go far enough that's what Jung did but nonetheless religions have their place and their uses and so what I've often said is when I became a when I became a Buddhist I became a better Christian and when I became a Jungian, I became a better Christian and a better Buddhist, both. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and it's interesting, too, that that cultural nihilism, um, the turning the back, even on turning the back on oneself is what, to me, it looks like, too. We've, we've had a full two and a half generations of two and a half generations ago. You had a lot of children who, you know, weren't parented to where the parents were trying to be their friend instead of the parent. 
So yeah. that's that starts off a trend. Well, the, the children didn't like to be told what to do, but they didn't grow out of it to where they made their own decisions. They just didn't like to be told what to do. Well, track that to the next generation. And then you have a bunch of children who run those parents because they don't want to do to their children what they didn't want done to them. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. How, you know, why would I want to be harsh and give my child any discipline whatsoever to understand that that consistency of work can produce results and can produce dramatic failures? But cool, that's an experience. Proceed to the next generation, two and a half generations later, and you basically have children who have been parented by children now parenting children, except now it's kidding children not parenting them. And I don't want to put that across as a generalization of the whole culture because there are plenty of great parents. And I, and honestly, lately, I've seen a lot of great kids who are really up there in, in their curiosity, their wonderment, and their insightful observations. Well, they're, they're teaching themselves now on the internet and they're not exactly. paying attention so you, to their parents. <laughs> right, exactly. Okay. So they, they, those children become the parent of the adult by their own induced, self-induced rite of passage. So I'm not saying there's no hope, but I think we have a pretty broad psychological event from a sociological perspective where the rite of passage, the difficulty, the trial is missing in the equation. And it's all supposed to be ice cream and soft. Yeah. Uh, and that's my soapbox. Yeah, I've, I'll step I've off been of troubled it, for, I've been troubled for years that, you know, going back into my children's generation, everybody's got a cargo cult going in at Christmas time. And, you know, I was in my youth, I know I was pretty happy to have one present at Christmas, right? <laughs> you know, or maybe two presents, one from my parents and one from Santa Claus. Um, but you know, not not the cargo cult that people end up with today. Well, you know, and to get off the superficial, I mean, not that that's superficial, but that I remember specifically, um, I think once it was an afternoon, we it was after Christmas, so Christmas afternoon. And my dad just turned around and he goes, should we whip up some of that salt, though, and make some more ornaments for next year? And it was, it wasn't preparation, but it was, but it was, let's take the Christmas spirit into the new year by let's make something that's not going to come to fruition for another 365 days. Mm -hmm. And I never thought about that until just right now, but the, the family connection of just doing something together, but he's like, let's whip up some salt though. But the problem is um, that day, the ornaments just were falling apart. We didn't know why. Well, what did Jordan do? <laughs> he accidentally <laughs> put the salt dough that hardens like concrete where my stepmother had had her pie crust dough. And then we used the pie crust dough for the ornaments. So they're falling apart. And we didn't realize until the knife wouldn't go through the pumpkin pie crust. <laughs> that no. <we> had- <laughs> so you know sometimes that was a great start but it went completely awry it went completely off 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 the rails but that i think goes back to like you say the cargo you know the christmas cargo it's like wow you're gonna have to two ups trucks just to finish delivering the presents yeah that's not what it's about okay i want to read this one sentence because then i have to change my pdf unfortunately because the way i did this this morning uh, it is the task of the psychologist to, to investigate these matters. Okay, so the, this is where he's saying, you know, it ain't my job, Martin, <laughs> yeah. to, uh, to deal with what you're talking about. Um, yeah, he's investigating. He's not solving. He's right. getting a sense of how do, like he said, how do the God, how do, do the God complexes behave so and and not in a behavioral way. Um, yeah. Okay. So then, I, actually, I should the, caveat. Yeah. I should just quickly caveat. If I say behavior here, I am most likely never referring to B.F. Skinner. 
just <laughs> I just want to make that very clear because he rather than a behaviorist, which was easily picked up, he was a he was one of the primary CIA torture technique inventors. Um, that's where behaviorism came from. Um, so uh, I just want to say, if I use behave or behavior, I'm not talking about BS Skinner. So please, yeah, you don't okay. have to respect that. But that's just a clarification I want to make that I don't know. <laughs> okay. Enough said about that. Um, so uh, finishing that sentence, though, theolog theologian certainly has not done it yet. I am afraid it is sheer prejudice against science, which hinders theologians from understanding my empirical standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, That's important. Seen, yeah, seen from this standpoint, the experience of God as Nolan's Volans, the psychic fact that I find myself confronted with, a factor in myself, more or less represented also by external circumstances, which proves to me to be an insurmountable power. For instance, a most rational professor of philosophy is entirely possessed by the fear of cancer, which he knows does not exist. Try to liberate such an unfortunate fellow from his predicament, and you will get an idea of psychic autonomy. And, you know, so it's, it's like trying to give up a uh, you know, a, a lucky charm or something like that. If you, you know, if you're, if you believe in your lucky charm, nobody's going to talk you out of it. Well, yeah. And just as Nolan's Volans, I mean, that's like it or not pretty much. It, it is what it is. I mean, so, and from there too, where the, theologians are afraid of the empirical or the scientific as if, um, as if somehow the theologians think that someone's going to try to come in and science their God to death to, you know, to empiric empirically dilute and make disappear their faith. And, and that's in the, in the end, that's impossible. Exactly. Because faith by its very, you know, there you go. It's impossible. Yeah. Um, and so Jung's place is he's looking at basically if I substitute some words, I mean, instead of how the God complexes behave, he's looking at how faith behaves, how the heart of the matter behaves, how inspiration behaves, how these things that have are completely formless behave. And I think yeah. that's, that's really, that's really, I think what he's up against is that he's up against the unfortunately inapplicable expectation of the theologians that he's somehow an enemy when in reality he's trying to make a segue between science and religion, but not the Einstein one where, you know, we'll get to the top of the mountain and the other one will see the other one's been there the whole time. <laughs> that kind of, you know, <clears throat> right. Um, and, and then psychic autonomy, you know, for, I think he for, says it right there. My, yeah. For my lights, Jung found the living God mm -hmm. and whereas Nietzsche denied the living God. So I'm sorry. Well, if the, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. As I was say, the Red Book, I mean, the Red Book was his <laughs> own church. I mean, that's the cathedral where Carl Jung worshiped the living God was in continually building um, just the idea of a cathedral. It's, it's laying brick by brick by brick for a very long time. And right. that's his Red Book. And, and, and uh, it's not only his red book, which is the prima materia of his life work. So really it's this very long time, all of his life's work points mm -hmm. back to the red book. Right. Um, and uh, so, so anyway, going on, I am sorry if X bothers about the question of the basis upon which religion rests. This is a metaphysical question, the solution of which I do not know. I am concerned with phenomenal religion, with its observable facts, to which I try to add a few psychological ob observations about basic events in the collective unconscious, the existence of which I can prove. Beyond this, I know nothing, and I have never made any assertions about it. I know nothing. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So he is, um, you know, indeed one of his most famous books is uh, Ion uh, Researches into the Phenomenology of the Self. Of the Self, right. And, and so what he does there is he talks about many different ways in which we human beings have referred to the self over the last 3,000 years. And, um, you know, so there's even a chapter about Nostradamus. It doesn't mean that he believes that Nostradamus had a woo-woo capacity for prediction, but rather that Nostradamus represents a, uh, an example of the self. I mean, the very way. definitely. I think yeah. his humor is coming back in here too, though, in which yeah. I try to add a few psychological observations about basic events in the collective unconscious, i.e. 22 volumes of few <laughs> observations, <clears throat> you yeah. know, plus letters, plus, you know, these. And, yeah. But I, he, he actually, at this point in the letter, he's, he's calmed down and he seems to be coming back to the table and his tone has changed here, which is interesting because I noticed the rise and fall as we move through where some places he's like, well, why? Come on, man. Why don't you get this? And right. in other places he's going, oh, okay, I see. I'll, I'll, I'll play tennis with you again and I'll, I'll back and forth. So how does Buber know something he cannot experience psychologically? How is such a thing possible at all? If not in the psyche, then where else? You see, it is always the same matter, the complete misunderstanding of the psychological argument. God, within the frame of psychology, is an autonomous complex, a dynamic image, and that is all psychology is ever able to state. It cannot know more about God. It cannot prove or disprove God's actual existence, but it does know how fallible images in the human mind are <laughs> yeah that's you, you think <laughs> yeah <laughs> well you know just add the word perspective the fallible yeah. images i mean and boober on one side of the tree and young on the other and they don't even see each other around the same trunk right and you know no matter how deep you go i've pointed out you know there's still a mystery that you can't yes you can't address uh, well it's interesting i was questioned the other day someone said why do you why do you go from capital g god to equals capital n nature um that's a thing and i'm like no 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 there are arcana which arcane or arcana simply means mystery or hidden there are arcane qualities in nature i mean how does nature work i don't know but it does there's a that godlike quality, that God image, peace, and capital in nature, which I find to be then stripping the personified gray-haired guy on the cloud reaching his hand down to become everything we experience around us and all the mysteries that occur in every moment there. Those arcana, those mysteries, those hidden. Right. So as you said, I mean, it's... Right. <clears throat> okay, so... Um... If Niels Bohr compares the model of atomic structure with a planetary system, he knows it is merely a model of a transcendent and unknown reality. And if I talk of the God image, I do not deny a transcendent dental reality. I merely insist on the psychic reality of the God complex or the God image as Niels Bohr proposes the analogy of a planetary planetary system he would not be as dumb as to believe that his model is an exact and true replica of the atom no empiricist in his senses would believe his models to be the eternal truth itself he knows too well how many changes are uh, any kind of reality undergoes in becoming a conscious representation Jordan, you want to... Yeah, um, it's interesting. The consistency, he, consistency here is the last sentence of each paragraph. He really is rounding the troops, marshaling the forces, rounding the... So in a sense, he's 
he's got the hammer on the nail. Um, yeah. And that, and in, in this sense, he's he's also making just an outside example, Niels Bohr, of someone making an attribution from one thing to another of two things that are different that are the same thing. So I think that literally the DNA in that paragraph is that we are talking about the same thing. We are shifting focus, but we are redirecting scale. The cell and the universe both have a world in them. I mean, in that yeah. sense. So all my ideas are names, models, and hypotheses for a better understanding of observable facts. I never dreamt that intelligent people could misunderstand them as theological statements, i.e. as a hypostasis. Uh, I was obviously too naive in this regard, and that is the reason why I was sometimes not careful enough to, re to repeat time and again. Uh, let's see. Time and again, but what I mean is only the psychic image of a noumenon, uh, Kant's thing in itself, which is not a negation, as you know. Um, and so, you know, here, Jung is pointing to the fact that all religious systems have as their basis um, noumena and numinous events, the things that happen in the psyche that are numinous and um, can't be denied. Um, you know, and so when you have a religious experience, an experience with the nomina, uh, there's no arguing with it. Uh, you know, not everybody may have seen it that way, but, you know, nonetheless, um, you know, I've many times shown the example of, of the light coming on me at the chapel of the Naval mm -hmm. Academy. Well, if somebody else was sitting in the chapel that particular day, it may not have been numinous to them, uh, but it surely was to me, and it completely changed my attitude. And also, you know, right there, boom, gave me an example of something numinous. Mm -hmm. And and, um, and so it's not a question of would everybody see that as a numinous event? Um, maybe not, but. I certainly took it that way. And so I'm, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. It was a religious experience for me. Um, well, you know, and that's the thing too, which is so important about that. That's not you digging in your heels. That's not you getting brittle. That's simply you are respecting the point of that experience needs no words. But you yeah. are shit, you know, to be, it doesn't need to be proven, explained or anything, but you, um, you're sharing it because other people then may see a similar experience, whether it's with light, dark or whatever, um, in their life. And they'll realize, oh, it just is. And that's mine. I mean, yeah. and, and it needs no words. And there's a lot of love in that you get a lot of tingles often when that happens, which is often a you know, a monitor of a numinous experience, your body responds, literally. <laughs> so this final paragraph is really a hoot. My empirical standpoint is so disappointingly simple that it needs only an average intelligence and a bit of common sense to understand it. But it needs an uncommon amount of prejudice or even ill will to misunderstand it. As it <laughs> <seems to me. laughs> There's that expectation. Yeah. I am sorry if I bore you with my commonplaces, but you asked for it. You can find them in most of my books, beginning with the year tw uh, 1912, almost half a century ago, and not yet noticed by authorities like Buber. I have spent a lifetime of work on psychological and psychopathological investigations. Buber criticizes me in a field in which he is incompetent and which he does not even understand. <laughs> yeah, he turns uh, around and at that point says, well, I don't talk about your rabbinical, you know, this and that, mm -hmm. you know. But in, he's, he's putting a very Jungian, a lot of words, tongue out at uber right now <laughs> yeah um and so there's a footnote here a couple i guess but one about newman 
uh, an object of purely intellectual intuition devoid of all phenomenal attributes. Uh, the term was introduced by Kant to distinguish between noumenon and phenomenon as an immediate object of perception. But, you know, I would argue that, the, that in my case, you know, and I, I have several that I've talked about in my uh, essay or my talk called Finding the Living God, um, you, you know, you can't necessarily always catch a picture of it, but I actually have. <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, it is possible um, to be an object of immediate perception. And it doesn't mean that it's convincing to anybody else, you know, and at one point I was going, um, to church at the at the uh, Naval Academy Chapel, and I I was finding that um, the the Protestant pastors that had been taken over by the fundamentalists, and I, I didn't find that a very um, mm -hmm. a very nice experience, let's say, and um, and so. No, I I stopped That's... going when there was a service on because I didn't like the fundamentalism, but, mm -hmm. but the church itself is, you know, I, I have numerous experiences there every time without fail. All I have to do is walk in the door right. and, and, uh, you know, all I have well... to do is walk in the door, look up at the list of hymns. And even when there's not a service, there's at least one hymn on the placard, and it's 808, and that hymn is the Navy hymn. And that hymn symbolizes so much in my lifetime that I, you know, even now I get emotional about it because I can't talk about what it means to me. Uh, without getting emotional because there's so mm -hmm. much tied up in my life for the last 65 years, believe it or not, since, mm -hmm. since I first heard it and was conscious of it when I was 10 years old. And, um, and you know, I was finding um, last week, I guess it was last week that the Army-Navy game was on. And after mm. the after the game, I was trying to talk to Tim about what it meant to me, and I just couldn't do it. Um, right. You know, it just made me so emotional because the game itself, not the score, not who wins or loses, because we all both win and lose in that game. Um, but because that game has been a part of my life for my whole life and it symbolizes so much um you know it's very hard for me to really talk about it in any depth without uh becoming emotional i mean um debbie and i sponsored 10 midshipmen at the naval academy uh about 20 years ago we started and um one of those young men who graduated in 2002 is now a squadron commander of an F-18 squadron and he's deployed on a carrier in what in the western pacific and um his you know his wife who spent a year in the annapolis area um also, so we became very close to her. Um, what, and she's now in Japan where they're stationed, um, was text messaging back and forth to Debbie during last week's game. And so, you know, just that fact in that one game, um, mm. you know, even, even that fact, you know, opens out on, you know, 20, let's see, 23 years of knowing those two individuals, the, the man and the, his wife. Um, 
that you know, we went to their wedding and all kinds of other things. So as soon as I start talking about them, it just opens out into all well, kinds of experience. You know, that's perfect, especially with the planetary example given in the previous paragraph. And that were these things, instead of I, I switched the word inspiration, go to they shift focus and they redirect the scale. The scale gets larger. It gets more in context and a larger context and smaller context. But I just sent you a link to a blog I did quite a while back with the DNA trail. And there's a of the solar system. And the words of the blog are, are of really of no consequence to this. It's just the active image that a lot of people think about our solar system and think it's just sitting there in space, hanging out. Reality is our whole solar system, like Earth goes around the sun, our whole solar system itself is moving in a 270 million year orbit around the galactic center. Right. So it makes an illusion to me from people who get stuck in their professions, yeah. say Jung versus Buber. And as Jung said, they, you know, they have too much prejudice and ill will. So I sent yeah. you a link to that blog that has the GIF um, that shows our solar system with a trailer from all the planets and a trailer from the sun uh, moving through the galaxy. And what's interesting is that our solar system's motions in total make a DNA shape. They make the DNA trail. And mm -hmm. so at the scale of our whole solar system moving is one of the smallest scales within us, the DNA strand. And it's, it's a wonderfully complex spiral motion GIF that just it's maybe three or four seconds long that just a little mini film that repeats right. so um when you get a chance maybe after the show take a look and see what you think but it's a it's a fun one mm -hmm. that i think shows yeah you know, things in motion and right. the different similarities at different or similarities at different scales yeah so i was i was just distracted by trying to follow the uh the youtube conversation which i can't necessarily uh do both right yeah and i i got this uh, this thing from patch um and when you get a chance take a look at the uh, link i sent you to one of my blogs that has that gif of our solar system actually in motion through the galaxy um, it feels to be a, a wonderful visual metaphor that don't get stuck. Don't think you're in you know, one spot. You're always in motion, even if you're thinking you're still. Okay, so here, here's, a, here's a numinous moment, uh, feel-good report uh, for, um, for Christmas. Um, we'll probably leave it at this, but let me um, see if I can get this up. And I'll share it with everyone. So shopping, shocking tip left by Secret Santa's stuns Howard County waitress. A Howard County waitress couldn't believe the amount of tip left by a group of Secret Santas seeking to brighten the holidays for others. Um, what started as an ordinary shift at the Silver Diner in Elk Ridge ended up becoming the most memorable day for waitress Roxana Selena. Just last week, Selena received a tip for a $25 check that baffled her. Uh, they put it on the side and said, we're going to give you an extra tip. And I saw all the cash, the hundreds, twenties, and tens. And I say, are you sure this is for me? And they said, yes. And uh, she told WBAL, the local station. So what was her tip? $910. I started crying. I got so emotional, very blessed. They got up and hugged me and they were crying with me saying, Roxana, you make us cry. I'm sorry. Uh, I said, I'm sorry, but this is so beautiful. You make me feel very special. Uh, a group of people seeking to brighten the holidays for others. 
uh, was behind the tremendously huge tip. It's like God sent me that gift special to me. It's like appreciation of life. So in this set, uh, her customers said the shocking gift couldn't have happened to a better person. She's just so happy and bubbly all the time. It's just great, a regular customer said. Uh, she's so giving. We just love her to see her. She brightens our day when we come in. Another regular customer said the secret Santa's told Salinas uh, she isn't the only person they could plan to surprise this holiday season. Mm -hmm. They hope to bestow big gifts upon others soon. Those people are angels and just not for me, for somebody else as well. She plans to use the tip to help pay rent, buy Christmas gifts, and send money back to her family in El Salvador. Nice. And, uh, reminds me of when we were in, uh, in Montana, we were in Boulder, Montana uh, recently, uh, Tim and I were with uh, Bob Manis, our, our co-conspirator in the confluence. And um, uh, the, the waitress we had in this, in this diner, uh, we were all, the only people in it because we had gotten delayed and it was mid mid morning by the time we got to this diner and everybody else had finished. And this waitress was just so bubbly. She says, I'm in love with life. And, uh, <laughs> and, and you know, she's just bouncing around and, and uh, she just made us uh, extremely happy that day. So there are wonderful people in the world that in, you know, un, in unexpected places and we need to recognize them on a regular basis. And, you know, I during the pandemic, especially, I've been trying to leave um, much larger than normal tips because mm -hmm. I, I know that the people who, who rely on tips, um, you know, they have a hard life and, and um, they don't earn a lot of money. And so if... Well, and I know, heard this over the summer, um, one of these, you know, the huge like $4,000 tip or something, and then mm -hmm. the owner made him split it and then she got fired, this new recent example of it. But the, over the summer after I moved here, it, it um, sparked an idea for me. I mean, when you get together with friends at any point and you cycle through like, okay, they're going to take you to this restaurant and then I'm going to take you to this restaurant. There's always somebody picking up the tab. Very rarely do we Dutch it. It's like, that's too much of a hassle. People, you know, quibbling over tips and such. Mm -hmm. But this summer when that started to occur, we noticed that there was the, it doesn't matter when I was going to pay, but let's have every single person at the table pay the 20% tip. So there's eight people. That's uh, eight times two, you know, it's mm -hmm. 16. That's 160% tip. Mm -hmm. And what we started to do is when we were out, you know, some one of us would pick up the bill, but then all of us would tip. And it's interesting. It wasn't so much the money, but there was the, we are all going to participate in the gratitude, not by slicing and dicing this tip so that we're all really miserly frugal. We're going to each all pay the same tip. And mm -hmm. not get competition. Don't give them 30 when I'm giving them 20. Let's decide the percentage. And then let's each cough that up. Mm -hmm. And I find that it's created a whole different dinner environment. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not like, you know, anyone knows if we walk in, um, it's, you know, it's not semi-famous, but it's so much fun because you're just engaging with the people the whole time. But like you said, I'm in love with life. You, you really start to notice where people's bright spots are. And even if they're kind of doldrum, you engage them and they're like, oh, oh, someone's going to talk. You don't just want to be served yeah, and, yeah. and you're really engaging. And so I think that's something that's come from the pandemic, too. Like you said, people really need it. And, and, and I don't want to waste their trouble. I'd rather pay them for their time, the value yeah. of it. Surely. Okay, well, what are we going to do about Boxing Day, Jordan? Let me ask you that. Well, uh, how about if I just wrap my hands in plaster and no gloves? 
<laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's well, I, coming up. I, I have, um, I have a question for you for Boxing Day. Okay. Uh, as you know, you have something under your tree for me. And, um, and so I will give you a riddle and we'll see if we can unpack it on Boxing Day. Mm. Okay. And so the rit rit riddle is, um, as you probably know, it's a book. It's pretty easy to tell it's a book. So what does the author of the book want us to be called? That's the question. Okay. What does the author of the book want us to be called? Right. Okay. So, um, mm -hmm. okay. So that, that's the riddle. And uh, let me see if you can catch that riddle, uh, catch the answer to that riddle before we get together uh, on Boxing Day. And the book will be a good topic for the, for Boxing Day. Well, and, um, I'll have another answer, I'm sure, by then. But what does the answer want us to be called? Or what does the author want us to be called? Mm -hmm. The author wants us to be called to living our true, our true selves. Okay, that's a, that's a fair guess. Uh, it, it's, it's... But that's just going to, that's a scrimmage. So we'll... we'll no, no, that, we'll... no, that's actually, um, you know, that's, a, that's half of it. Okay, that's half of it. That's the, yeah, that's the both part, but not the end part. <laughs> right, but but that's not the that's not the ultimate answer, and um, and so that but that is certainly a that's certainly a the psychological part of it, um, and so uh, mm, I guess that's a great we'll, question. I like yeah, that. What, what does the author of the book want us to be called? And I'm actually made it easy for you, but, um, you know, uh, well, I haven't opened the book. I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's with my, my mom, <laughs> my mom said, can you go ahead and send me another dated picture of the presents that you haven't opened yet? <laughs> so it's, you know, keeping you honest from 700 miles. Right. <laughs> okay. It's not Christmas Eve yet. No early opening. So, yep. <clears throat> Okay, so anyway, uh, have a Merry Christmas, everybody. We will have tomorrow, we will still have a uh, Monday night class as usual. And on Wednesday, we'll still have an advanced reading group class as usual um, before Christmas. So I'm not going to say an ultimate Merry Christmas to you, Jordan. I'll probably see you again before then. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in case for those who are joining us from around the world, uh, let me wish you a happy holidays and uh, however you celebrate them. And, and before before we go today, um, <clears throat> I'd I'd like to end my words on on a visual note. I sure. I had sent you that that link. Take a look at that GIF of our solar system, and just it's interesting to me. Um, just gazing at it, how, you know, beyond cool it is, it's, there's, it's, it's just wonderfully mesmerizing of, oh, that's, that's us. That's, that's us at a huge scale, all of the solar system moving at once in its 270 or what have you million year orbit around the galactic center. But just this GIF, it's like three or four seconds and it just repeats on a loop. But take a look at that, Skip, if you would. Um, okay, I'm trying to find the GIF you're talking about here. It just cl on the, click on the link, and then it'll take you to my blog, and then scroll down, and you should be able to put that to where the only thing you see is the GIF. The words on the blog are of, of not oh, much yeah, yeah. Uh, Okay, I see it. All right, I've got it now. So let me, I will share that. And, it shows, uh, it feels like the, the connections. <clears throat> there that are moving and living or there's young and that's our whole solar system moving the sun has its trailer and then all the planets around it well that's right um you know that is young and that is the way we live our lives um 
if yeah. if you think of of that large ball as the let's say collective unconscious mm. and uh, the smaller things as uh, individual humans that are orbiting the collective unconscious, um, you know, which is what Jung ultimately admitted that the collective unconscious and the unconscious are, can be called God. And so Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, this living watch moving. So I thought that that might be a nice image for everyone to take into their week about scale and movement and, and life. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's one of the messages this week too, with Christmas and the holidays, Hanukkah, et cetera, with everyone, um, life. I mean, and blessings to everybody out there, your life, your way kind of thing. Yeah. And your yeah. light, your way. Right. Um, so anyway, uh, peace, everyone. We'll see you next week, hopefully. And, and Jordan is going to tell us what the author of the book wants us to be called. And, Love it. Uh, and, uh, and I agree with that wish. So. Um, see, see you next week.